Okay. How, how are you doing, sir? Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Script. I'm happy to be here. Um, <laughs> conversing, socializing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's nice because, um, I, I mean, you, you've had some uh, colleagues that re reached out to me, and it was uh, a pleasure to discover some of your some of your work. I'm happy to discuss a little bit here. So for those in the audience that might not know, please introduce yourself and uh, why you're here. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I go online as Denali. I do a weekly show with my co-host, which is George Peter Katsis, uh, on a joke. King adventure show where we kind of read the headlines of the day and kind of roast it. And, uh, and then we do a public domain movie roasting on Fridays and Saturday, but I'm also known as Brent Benson. That's my real name. And I'm also the creator of a IP called the immortal mask, which I'm uh, about to launch soon uh, on Kickstarter. That is awesome. And The Immortal Mask is uh, essentially some a graphic novel series. Am, am I correct in that assessment? Absolutely. It's a graphic novel. And it's uh, based on the golden age of storytelling. So it has a lot of the Shadow, Doc Savage, the uh, Phantom, Tarzan, kind of those uh, storylines, but also mixed in with um, a lot of the 70s, which is kind of like Three Days of the Concord, if you like uh, Doctor Strange and Doctor Faith, mm -hmm. and then if you have and if you like action, it also has John Wick and Born Identity. So essentially, what you've done here is you've captured the the greatness of the Golden Age and the inventiveness of the Bronze Age when it came to like comic books, pulps, and storytelling, and they just kind of melded them together for this uh, for this particular IP you've developed. Absolutely, because I was looking at all the greats, I kind of was taking inventory because I have a huge comic book collection and I was looking at what people were relating to and what people were liking to and always came upon, you know, here's the great, here's George Lucas or here's Chris Claremont, Alan Moore. And I'm, I was kind of looking, it's like, okay, what stories when I was a kid and a teenager was making me happy. And I started looking at those stories in the, which were predominantly in the seventies and, 80s and then i looked at their uh interests and their things and i said you know what i have similar interests i have a lot of things that are in common let me focus onto the onto that core element that made everything great kind of like how you phrased it and that's how i went running <laughs> um one of the best compliments when i was showing off the immortal mask some of the initial concept they said oh cool golden age character who developed it and i said I did. <laughs> I developed that character. That's how in tune the uh, Mortal Mass was to that era kind of deal. They thought it was actually from it was already an original character from back in the day. Just like a forgotten forgotten piece of, of history type of thing. That was the tone that you managed to nail with these with these early concepts, right? Exactly. No, and that, that was something, too, that I, I picked up and I and I noticed. I mean, in the proof that uh, some, you know, some of your team members sent me, mm -hmm. uh, I picked up uh, references to Walter B. Gibson. Uh, who is known for writing the shadow pulps? Yeah, uh, I I love the the old style uh, of the artwork that you have in there, and I love it's clean. It's it's clean and consistent, but it does harken to kind of that that third generation of art that we saw in comic books that kind of really started to take shape in the Bronze Age, right before we got into like the 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 more the next stage of details and more of the modern age of comic books. I really right. uh, liked that, and I thought the coloring. In the on these pa pages was like really really well done. There was definitely a different type of technique than what I'm used to seeing in, in more contemporary books. How did you come to terms with like the art style for for this type of comic? Like, what were your really uh, main influence on, on the art style for this? Before we get into the writing parts, going back to a lot of French comic books, you know, European comic books, and finding out they were actually using art techniques from before. They kind of perfected it back in the Bronze Age with the uh, paneling. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, comic strips are comic books. So basically, I had to unlearn everything I knew about comic books, unlearn all of it, dump it in my mouth and kind of reassess on it. Wally Woods Cannon and um, Adam, uh, Alex Raymond's The Flash Gordon and his uh, Rip Kirby were major strong influence in that, especially as 
you go through the storytelling, they were precise. They told you enough information. You could see it also in uh, Jack Kirby's style and Steve Ditko's styles as well at the early Spider-Man and Fantastic Four comic book. There was a rhythm and rhyme how they did it. And it took me a while to understand why those were important. Uh, when we get to the 90, how you mentioned stylized and these detail oriented comic book, it kind of back, it harsened back to some of the, com- the conversation we had with cinema, which was is practical effects better or CG is better? And one of the things that directors or special effects artists are saying, oh, we, we, we love CGI because we can put in everything in the, in the frame now. We don't have to harken back. But watching a lot of old stuff back in the 70s and old puppetry, there's an element of you have to allow the audience to have imagination and fill in those gaps. That way they can become proactive and invest, invested in the story, invested in the world. So kind of like Neil Iser's, uh The Spirit, those artists knew how much detail to put into the panel and how much to leave out so the audience can travel along with the character and experience the character. That's why those early comic books, so magical, it's so inspirational and so much impact to the people and creators that people want to continue on following the journeys of those superheroes. It's because they knew how much to put in there. And for the modern day, they put too much stuff in there that it overwhelms the people, I feel, as a reader, because I did collect a lot of it, in my opinion. of Some of the modern stuff takes you out of the story. You're you get too confused with it. Like overstimulated? It's overstimulated. You're, I, I'm too overstimulated with the art that I'm not focusing on what the story is. And by the time I, I'm left, I, I feel like, oh, I've spent 20 or 10 bucks on a 10-page story. Even though the art was amazing, even though everything was amazing, top-notch, and extremely well, I felt empty because I wasn't able to digest the story. The art was too overwhelming, overpowered the story. That's, uh, that's fantastic. So... What was some of the obstacles that you had to face in order to kind of um, circumvent that that art style that, although beautiful, didn't mm-hmm. best fit your story? I kept going back to the greatest, Jack Kirby, St- uh, Dickel, Alex Raymond, Wally Wood. What did they do in their story that made it grounded and overstimulate and focus? And I looked at both Japanese mangas and also the European comic books and see what they all had in common. What made me appreciate the artwork? but also allowed me to savor the story. And it came back to this uh, distilling and back to the essence. It was this simple paneling. It, it's, it wasn't broken. It was the paneling was at peak. What I've presented you in this book is the peak of that research, the best option. Because if you go back to the comic books, every comic book that's favorite, it's, it's this art style. Uh, well, that's one of the things I noticed is that each one of the panels are are really well framed. There's a very easy to digest narrative flow of what they are. You, you're not confused as which panel is supposed to come first because normally it's like left and right. But if you have certain levels of layering or you have certain positions where like a larger panel on, say, the left side of the page starts a little lower b- before the top one. But sometimes they throw dialogue in the bottom one that and the bubble stretches over to the top of the first panel. And, you know, first time readers would be really disjointed by by that type of stuff. Uh, exactly. More experienced readers would understand it. And I, I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. You kind of really did lay this out for not just the experienced comic book reader, but also for a very for like a first time buyer. Exactly. So I, I really I thought that was really, really clever and, and you know, a good marketing tactic for you as well. You're not trying to sort of uh, run before you walk, so to speak, even though at least on the art side of things, even though you've got this really fun and engaging mystery and and I, I liken it to, you know, uh, shows of the 70s, such as like Quincy, Columbo, Policewoman. Were any of those types of television shows influential with crafting the narrative of your book? Probably in the recess of my mind. Those are shows I did watch in the back uh, police stories as well. The Six Million Dollar Men, Bionic Woman, Quantum Leap. Those uh, because those are stories that have gone over 100 episodes kind of deal. And you have to keep the audience engaged. So learning from those uh, stories. And those uh, shows and episodes also help kind of frame what people are looking for. I'm introducing the people to this world and I need to keep them invested in the world. So those kind of like the techniques of those shows simmer in the back of my mind. That's always right. So with that in mind, 
how about we get a little bit more into the the nitty and gritty of the immortal mask pitch us the premise of this book to uh to get people as interested as uh you got me <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely well here you go the immortal mask is a 1970 superhero crime noir adventure that follows a retired soldier down on his luck who is given a covenant interview with a death row inmate what he learns from the interview thrusts him into Atlanta's shadowy underworld. He will have to utilize his military training to survive from being hunted for the information to topple the most powerful ruling class in the city. Yeah, that's a very 70s style premise. It reminds me of there, there's a very a movie that not many people have seen before called The Seven Ups, where it's a bunch of cops that know how to get a criminal and secure a conviction for at least seven years and up in jail. It has that type of conspiratorial story around it like there's something big bigger going on than this one small simple task and i like the escalation for it what what made you choose this type of story to be the introductory story what was the allure to it compared to other options that may have been swirling around in your head at the time it was basically the mystery you're coming unknown to the world how it and it's always it's always a mystery it's always a curiosity that always gets you and that's what i was kind of excited i was discovering as I was writing the journey of Benjamin or Benji, who's the main character, I was following along with him, uh, trying to understand what this mystery, where, why am I embroiled in this? What's going on? And I was asking those questions and writing response to them and putting in, you know, questions that couldn't be answered. I was saying, okay, those are hooks I have for later on. And this genre if you always look, the most popular stories are always mystery stories. Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. Lupin, Murder, She Wrote, Alumbo, Police Stories, uh, any of the uh, NCIS, whatever. Even Dexter is a mystery show if you put it in the right lens because you're always engaged. You're always following along with the character to figure out what's going on. And that's what kind of drew me. It's like, this is a perfect story. And it's also a, a perfect beginning point for Benji in his journey to this wonderful and supernatural and mystical story that will be grounded, but it'll escalate. It will escalate. And one of the things I thought was very inventive is that this uh, Benji story is really just one chapter in a much grander scale that you've developed in regards to the lore of the Immortal Mask. Please share with us whatever you can with obviously without st with spoilers uh, avoided, of course. <laughs> right. Um, share with us some of the lore that you're playing around with that you can tease us and uh, and those listening of what the Immortal Mask is. I mean, it's going to be a little bit tricky, of course, because there's so much right. we would want to know, obviously. Yes. But, yeah. Just like share with us a little bit of the nor the, the the lore, the concept and, and the inspiration, because it does run parallel to this particular type of story. The inspiration has been kind of like the Phantom, for those who are aware of the Phantom, inheriting uh, will uh, from one another in the line of say, successions. This book consists of three stories, one set in the 1930s. You have a, sh a short story of the Immortal Mask at that time. Benji is the Immortal Mask uh, at the 1970s. And then you have a, a story at the end of the 1850 Immortal Mask. And you realize that this is a bigger uh, uh, story that I'm introducing you, but I'm giving you snippets to let you understand, whoa, 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 just because you're following Benji, there's more story, there's more uh, aspects of the Immortal Mask. Maybe Benji isn't able to intersect with it, but I have the ability to present you some other aspects, some other angle of this world that other immortal masses would contribute to this story. I thought that was really fascinating because it does follow the, the Lee Falk, the Phantom aspect in that the immortal mask is is by and large, its, it's core rule is that it is a mantle that's passed on from one person to another through whatever means the the previous generation determines to the to the next. I thought that's great because it opens opens up a lot of potential for a very wide range of stories and people can gravitate towards who was their favorite person who who donned the cowl so to speak or the mask <laughs> right. uh, for their adventures without you know trying to create a type of absolutism to it as well, which I think Absolutely. is nice and good flexibility to that. I like how that starts off at the beginning because um 
not to say that I don't like other characters that create their own, you know, tools or disguises for to be heroes in, in the world, but like that makes it a very intimate story between them uh, for that particular, you know, creation. It's like, it's, you know, when Bruce Wayne develops Batman, that's his, that's his baby. When Peter Parker develops Spider-Man, that's his thing. That's his baby. But here we have something where someone else has developed it, but it's been bestowed onto people that are worthy and it's a responsibility that they have to undertake. And it's it's a legacy thing, but it's not a legacy through blood. It's a legacy, I guess, through morals. Correct. Every mask inheritor adds something to the mask and gives that to the next mask. So that's also going to be part of the story developing. How do you grapple wearing the mantle and how does that judge you? How do you judge yourself to the contrast of those previous holders kind of so yeah that's one of the ideas uh, that was banging around my head when i was developing it and it's a good fascinating one because it does harken back to the pulp style that uh that inspired you um mm -hmm. as you were writing the script did you encounter any unexpected surprises or revelations during the creative process to kind of better direct you to the the resolution from this first book massive <laughs> i can <laughs> I, it's it's understatement but massive i have up to 16 volumes worth of material that came out all that i wanted to put in the story but couldn't because it was too much it was it would have mm. overloaded but all those material all of those explosion all those mind bending twists everything that as i was writing it as i was expanding as i was answering the question you imagine who was the first immortal mass i have that story in place where did it go i have that lineup i have a timeline from the first where to benji and i know if i wanted to go to the past i can clock i know the time frame i know the stories i know the details the adults all culminating to this location think of this time period as the quickening from highland if i could express it in words okay that is, that's cool so i guess uh, uh only a few more questions left before we sure. get into the final legs of this and i appreciate your time absolutely so how do you see a mortal mass kind of fitting into the larger landscape of of the comic book genre i mean yes you're going independent so mm -hmm. obviously you're not going to have the sales numbers of the more established publishers that have been around for a high hundred years no one's ever expecting that but you're definitely going to be trying to make an impact with this book and build a core audience All right what's your like long-term plan to to sustain this because you're using a, a a slightly different model you've you've already finished the book correct and it's being uh launched soon which you, uh, people listening to this will see the the links that will direct you to where you can um, take a look at the book, the sample pages that uh, you put on your website, and go and purchase a copy. So please uh, explain to us a little bit of that process. So yeah, so one of the things that a lot of people said was, you know, oh, we got to convince the artists or the creators to telling the stories, you know, that we want. And I kind of said, you know what, let me tell the stories that I want to read. I'm bringing the joy that came from this process, the joys that I read as a, as a co avid comic book reader, and I poured it into this book. And my long-term goal is to eventually tell all the stories of the Immortal Mask and to build Denali's comic into a big studio where I'm not just doing the Immortal Mask, but I'm doing other projects as well and other creations and releasing on that. So it's not a one-time thing. This is an ongoing production. Right now, I'm focused on the Immortal Mass, working hard, writing the stories, having fun with it. And that's that's a key thing, is I'm having immense fun with it, creating the world, creating the uh, drama, creating the relationship, just building out this world. It's been consuming a lot of my time, but I'm having so much fun with, you know, if somebody told me that writing a comic book would, would, not, uh, would be, uh, isn't as fun as they say, that you have all this deadline, no. It's it's completely fun mm -hmm. when you're when you're playing with the in the sandbox that you've created. How many how much difficulty have you found in trying to like hone in exactly what you're trying to express to the audience, knowing that they don't have all the the lore swirling around in their heads the way that you do? Uh, what, what sort of stuff have you done to try and get around that? so that you're able to hook the audience in with this story, but not over, like not front load them with exposition. Because that was one of the things I really enjoyed about this book is that the, the story is well paced out and you're learning little bits of everything at a good pace to the point where you don't feel like there's 
it, it doesn't feel like the first act of a Christopher Nolan film where you're just bombarded with all this exposition that's given up to us by Michael Caine. <laughs> like you, you've actually yeah. got it like well, well structured and, and thrown out there. Could you share with us a little bit of the process? How did you discipline yourself to, to execute that type of narrative style? Basically, I realized early on that I had so much so many ideas were burning my head left and right that I had to cut to shafts, so to speak. There's a good idea. And I said, does this help further the plot along? Does this help form the audience what's going on? And I basically had to look at my writing script and I had to visualize like if I was a director and kind of storyboard it and kind of look the like build the episode in my mind. And if I every time I felt overwhelmed, of the story and I said oh I feel overwhelmed this is kind of dragging I would look at it and say this is too much if I'm feeling overwhelmed the audience is going to be feeling overwhelmed and I had to kind of edit it like I was editing a movie and figuring out this is the pace here's the, here's the point here's the plot's moving forward I'm giving you nuggets golden nuggets so you don't have to uh, leave the experience because the, the last thing I want you to do is feel uh, I'm, I wasn't invested I wasn't interested I want everybody who reads the book to go in and say, this is amazing. It, it went so fast. It's like, it's one like those long films mm -hmm. that were, were well pasted that you were so excited by the time you ended. And it's like, Oh, this movie was two hours and 50 minutes. It didn't feel like that. And that's how I pasted my story. That's how I disciplined. It's anytime I felt like it was lagging, I would revise it, look at it again and say, does this further the plot along? And that's how I move forward. That's that's great to hear. That's a good good method to have. You don't see that too often in, in um, writers with their debut books, uh, especially in this type, because again, the excitement kind of overwhelms you into like, oh man, I'm so excited about this idea. I just got to tell everybody. And you just kind of like a kid when they discover something new and they tell their parents, it's just a, it's a long run on sentence of all the cool things that they experienced. And as on the reciprocating side of that, you're like, well, I hear what you're saying. I have no idea what you're saying because it's too fast. And, and I and I think that was a that's that's what I appreciated about this this book for you is it flowed rather rather well. One of the other aspects before we get towards the end here is that um, there's a lot of interesting historical references in this book. So, from your perspective, are you trying to make this um, a fictional world that parallels our actual reality with certain historical points that you brought up? Or are you just having fun with the with the generation and, and this particular decade for, for those that might be familiar with what was happening in the 70s at this time? A little of both. You know, you always have to have fun if you're going to do a period piece, you know, whether it's a Victorian or it's, you know, the 1920s, the rolling 20s, as they were called, or the 70s. You're always having fun with those generational things. I like history as well. I read a lot of history books, a lot of information about different cultures, all of that. So I like to bring that into the stories as well to kind of flavor that because it adds a little bit more, more sincerity, authenticity to the story. But it's also kind of like, you know, it's like it's like a parallel, like how some of the creators said Marvel is it's just a parallel universe, but, it's, you, but you can see it from the window. Mm -hmm. So kind of that inspiration kind of flowed into the those like that idea as well great so brent please uh share with the audience where can they find uh, a mortal mask to buy and read all right you can always go at denalis.com that's d-i-n-a-l-e-s.com right now we're doing the kickstarter for the immortal mask the first book 200 pages it has th uh, three stories 1930 1970 and 1850s plus extra pages on how the stories were produced in the, uh, as extras. It's going to be a 30-day campaign. Once the 30 campaign uh, is done, we'll ship it within one to three months. The prints are at the prints file already at the printers waiting for file. It's front-loaded. What you're doing is helping me help uh, move faster to produce the second book. That's the purpose of this Kickstarter. So the uh, website is handy for all the things. You know, anything mortal mass, go to denialist.com. Well, that's that's great to to hear. Uh, I encourage everyone to check it out. The art is fantastic. I was, again, very humbled to uh, receive one of the proofs to read over. I quite enjoyed it. It was well, the best part was is that I had 
didn't know where the story was going. And by the time I got to the end, it all kind of tied up itself in a nice, interesting fashion that basically opened it up for more adventures, which I look forward to to reading. So I strongly encourage everyone to check it out, make your own decisions. And if you feel so inclined, please consider buying a copy of The Immortal Mask. I, I think uh, if you pull that trigger, you won't be disappointed. Uh, with that, is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience before we call it a day? Like always, there's no rest for The Immortal Mask. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of you for listening. Never forget, guys, when it comes to great story, it all starts with the script.